Well, welcome everyone. I'm so glad to see so many people here and I'm thrilled that we have um, Britt Bennett to speak with us this evening in our series, Great Writers, Great Readings. Thank you, Athleen Collins, um, for suggesting this brilliant idea and to the Ken Cultural Center, which um, you run for making this um, series possible. We are so fortunate to have it. Just seven years or so ago, Britt Bennett shot into the literary scene with her essay, I Don't Know What to Do with Good White People. It was published in Jezebel and viewed over 1 million times in the essay's first days and has been read widely ever since. She was still in graduate school at the time. Her first novel, The Mothers, followed soon thereafter and became a New York Times bestseller, a coming of age story that explores different motherhoods from the old Sears to a mother who aborts her baby as a teenager. Now, just this past fall in the midst of a global pandemic and a racial, a racial reckoning that has been boiling over for centuries, Bennett published The Vanish Vanishing Half, the story of twin sisters whose lives take divergent paths when one sister disappears into a life of passing. With all of her work, Bennett captures you with the story, pulls you in immediately, and doesn't let you go until the last sentence, when she leaves the reader with so much to think about. Bennett's novels and her many essays stay with you long after you've finished the last page. I share now her brief and potent bio from her website, BrittBennett.com. Born and raised in Southern California, Britt Bennett graduated from Stanford U University and later earned her MFA in fiction at the University of Michigan. Her debut novel, The Mothers, was a New York Times bestseller, and her second novel, The Vanishing Half, was an instant number one New York Times bestseller. She is a National Book Foundation Five Under 35 honoree, and in 2021, she was chosen as one of um, Time's Next 100 Influential People. Her essays have been featured in The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, The Paris Review, and Jezebel. The format of this evening will be a conversation. Britt Bennett will read a few passages and I will ask uh, questions as we delve into, the, into process and craft. We will speak for 40 minutes or so and then she will take questions from the audience, which I will try to facilitate. And when those questions, you can either raise your hand or if you feel comfortable speaking, and we'll make sure we get to you, or you can put um, your question in the chat. Um, and you know that that's uh, pretty much it. I really, really want to hear from students um, more than anyone else. Um, and uh, I, I'm just so thrilled that we have um, Britt with us tonight. And I hope you'll all help me welcome her. Um, and uh, if we were in the audience, there everybody would be clapping right now. <laughs> Thank um, you. So lots of clap, clapping sound. Um, and I thought we could begin right away with you reading your, the first passage she selected for, and I, I think they're probably all about five minutes or so or thereabouts. And um, you know, it's lovely to hear it's lovely to hear the author's voice um, to get us going. Sure. So, well. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me. Um, and thank you everyone for watching. Uh, yeah, I have a few different selections. Um, the first one is just from the very opening of the book. So there is no uh, lengthy preamble. I'll just jump in. Um, so this is from the opening of The Vanishing Half. The morning one of the lost twins returned to Mallard. Lou LeBon ran to the diner to break the news. And even now, many years later, Everyone remembers the shock of sweaty Lou pushing through the glass doors, chest heaving, neckline darkened with his own effort. The barely awake customers clamored around him, 10 or so, although more would lie and say that they'd been there too, if only to pretend that this once they'd witnessed something truly exciting. In that little farm town, nothing surprising ever happened, not since the Vignes twins had disappeared. But that morning in April 1968, on his way to work, Lou spotted Desiree Vignes walking along Cartridge Road 
carrying a small leather suitcase. She looked exactly the same as when she'd left at 16, still light, her skin the color of sand, barely wet, her hipless body reminding him of a branch caught in a strong breeze. She was hurrying, her head bent, and Lou paused here, a bit of a showman. She was holding the hand of a girl, seven or eight, and black as tar. Blue black, he said, like she flown direct from Africa. Lou's egg house splintered into a dozen different conversations. The line cook wondered if it had been Desiree after all, since Lou was turning 60 in May and still too vain to wear his eyeglasses. The waitress said that it had to be. Even a blind man could spot a Vignes girl and it certainly couldn't have been that other one. The diners. Oh. Wait. Um, I can't hear you suddenly. Brett, can you hear us? We can't Hello? hear you. There you go. Hey, can you hear me? Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, everybody. I've been having technical difficulties today. No problem. <laughs> That's, this is the age of Zoom. Yes, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. Um, the diners abandoning grits and eggs on the counter didn't care about that Vinny's foolishness. Who on earth was the dark child? Could she possibly be Desiree's? Well, who else's could it be, Lou said. He grabbed a handful of napkins from the dispenser, dabbing his damp forehead. Maybe it's an orphan that got took in. I just don't see how nothing that black could have come out Desiree. Desiree seemed like the type to take in no orphan to you. Of course she didn't. She was a selfish girl. If they remembered anything about Desiree, it was that, and most didn't recall much more. The twins had been gone 14 years, nearly as long as anyone had ever known them. Vanished from bed after the Founders Day dance while their mother slept right down the hall. One morning, the twins crowded in front of their bathroom mirror, four identical girls fussing with their hair. The next, the bed was empty, the covers pulled back like any other day, taut when Stella made it, crumpled when Desiree did. The town spent all morning searching for them, calling for their names through the woods, wondering stupidly if they had been taken. Their disappearance seemed as sudden as the rapture, all of Mallard the sinners left behind. Naturally, the truth was neither sinister nor mystical, the twins soon surfaced in New Orleans, selfish girls running from responsibility. They wouldn't stay away long. City living would tire them out. They'd run out of money and gall and come sniffling back to their mother's porch, but they never returned again. Instead, after a year, the twins scattered, their lives splitting as evenly as their shared egg. Stella became white and Desiree married the darkest man she could find. Now she was back, Lord knows why, homesick maybe, missing her mother after all those years or wanting to flaunt that dark daughter of hers. In Mallard, nobody married dark, nobody left either, but Desiree had already done that. Marrying a dark man and dragging his blue black child all over town was one step too far. I think I'll, I'll stop right there. Okay, um, so I, I, I'd love to ask about openings. There are a lot of students here and we, we speak a lot about this and how, how do you decide where to start? But even just backing up a little bit, you, you're, you're able to get everything in here in this opening. And it still <laughs> it feels like, uh, you know, it, it, um, it, it, we're, we're with Lou's perspective too a little bit. And he's, it's like there's th this quality of, of, of gossip, which they say is the oldest form of storytelling. And uh, there's a return um she's coming back to town you set up you, you you set up everything your your third um person point of view perch that gives you the ability to look down but also come out from uh within your characters you set up um you know disappearance and reappearance you set up colorism you set up um you know you set up your story um with with her return and you know, how 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 do you how does that happen? Uh, how do you <laughs> how do you choose to you know how do you make these choices? Um, how do you understand where to begin? Yeah, I mean, I, I think with this book, I always knew that I wanted to start with Desiree returning. Um, that was one part of the book that never changed from draft to draft. Um, and I think for some of the reasons that you just pointed out, I think it. I knew that for the opening of the book, I needed to 
establish the town that you are in this very particular place that has a very particular set of values. Um, I wanted to set up the kind of mythology behind the twins. Um, and I also wanted to set up that Desiree is returning, not only returning, but with this daughter um, and a daughter who is dark skin and whose skin is going to cause problems from her for her in this town. So I knew that those were the main elements that I wanted to establish. And I think that gossip is very useful um, because it's a it's a it's interesting. It's like an interesting way of providing information that could otherwise feel kind of expository. Um, it's a way of providing it that is imbued with conflict. Um, it establishes the the sort of values of the place because this is what people are gossiping about. Um, and I, so I think it, it did all of those things that I wanted it to do. And I think ultimately, I believe that when I open a novel, I just want to give you as much information as you need to know. I don't believe in holding anything back. Um, I think that it, the story becomes much more interesting when you tell people things, uh, versus when you keep things from the reader. Um, and I think for me, the big question is always like, what do I want readers to wonder about? Because sometimes I think when I'm reading work, um, published and unpublished, sometimes I think writers, we set up questions that we're not actually that interested in answering. So you have the reader, like, I, like, I didn't want the reader to be thinking like, oh, did, you know, what happened to Stella? Did she die? Like, I, I, I wanted them to know that like, no, she has passed for white. This is what Stella has done. Um, so I wanted to give that information. And then the question then becomes like, well, why did she do that? Where did she go? Um, you know, those are more interesting questions to me than if I had kept that from you that she's passing. Um, so I think for me, that's one of the big things is realizing what questions I want the reader to actually think about and how can I give you the other information that you need to know so that you're not wondering about things that I don't really care about as a writer, <laughs> so that you're wondering about questions that are more interesting. That's such a great way to put it. Um, students often feel that, you know, about, I, I've made that mistake too, that you have to withhold to get to, you know, to create a tension, but it's a false tension. And sometimes to just say it, uh, she, you, you, as you do here um, with, the, you know, the, the, the theme of the entire novel that she went and passed the sister, um, there's, you, you know, you, you, you take away, um, the, the the possibility of you know it it maybe becoming like a, a false um yeah. uh tension yeah. and but students sometimes it, it takes them a while to get to that they're afraid to reveal too much oh i'm giving yes. it all away or it's too expository so how do you um how do you, is it just practice that get, gets you there? Do you understand that intuitively? Or, or what do you say to students who, you know, yeah. who, who think that withholding is the right thing to do? Well, that's something I had to learn in grad school because I had a professor who said that to me that we create tension by what we reveal, not by what we withhold. And I think that's how I've come to think of it, of, you know, I'm going to, you know, it's the same thing, My the opening of my first book. I'm just going to tell you outright, this is about a girl who's had this abortion. Um, and I tell that to you in the first pages of the book. And because then my the questions that I'm interested in are not, you know, oh no, she got pregnant, what is she going to do? Like, I'm not interested in that question. And if I don't give you that information, then the reader is gonna be asking that question that to me is uninteresting. So I want you to know this, these are the facts of it. Now what happened, that to me is more interesting. So I'm gonna tell you that Stella is passing and then you're, I'm leading you to the questions that I want you to wonder. So I think my advice is always just go there. Um, and then if you decide you don't want to reel it back, but you have to go there when you're drafting because then you might discover something really interesting about the characters or about the story that you wouldn't have if you were saving it somehow. You know, I, I, I think that you always have to go there, um, even if just for your, the, your own sake, and then you can always reel it back. But um, I think that that's what I try to do when I'm writing is revealing as much information as I can off the top and allowing then myself to actually follow the questions that I'm, I'm most interested in. Because most of the time that question is not what happened, you know, like, yeah as when I'm writing like the literal nuts and bolts of what people have done and 
you know, that even the question of where is Stella is less interesting than sort of like, how is Stella? Like, like who did she become? That's really what I'm interested in, not where did she logistically land? Because I also tell you that fairly soon too. So I want to lead, I think that's always the thing you need to, or I want to think about as a writer is what questions do I want the reader to ask and how can I lead them to that question and not lead them to questions that I don't care about. And as you're thinking about your novels before, I'm sure you're um, drafting something now or, you know, before you, you, are the questions what come first? I think so. Um, you know, I think that was another really great piece of advice that I received in grad school, which was begin with a question and not answers. Um, so I try to think about the questions that are most exciting to me about the work, what is challenging to me, what are the things that I, you know, really care about? Um, you know, the thing I'm working on now, it begins with a funeral. So it's just like, you know, I'm telling you when the person died, how the person died, like that's, it's not, that's not the central mystery of the book is like, what happened to her? Um, I'm going to tell you that from the first page. So for me, it's like realizing, okay, then what is interesting about this life? That is what I'm actually trying to figure out. Um, so I'm going to just, I'm, I don't want you to be reading the book thinking that the mystery is, oh, well, how did they die? Like, that doesn't matter to me that much, you know? Um, so I think sometimes I start with it, sometimes I discover it in writing, but I think that the central, knowing what questions you're interested in the writer, I think is one of the most important things. Uh, that's, that's so important for everyone to hear. Um, and so, so perfectly said. Um, you know, along these same lines of, you know, the, the stuff you need when you begin, how, how do you find your voice? How do you find, you know, how did it come to you to, to employ gossip, the, the, the sense of gossip in the voice? Um, but your overall voice isn't one of, you know, isn't, isn't that, but you're allowed to do that from within the voice you've created. So how do you, how do you arrive at that? I think again, it's for me, it's kind of exploration um, because I think the voices of all of my projects are different slightly. Um, uh, so I think that's, I guess some of it for me for this book was was feeling like I wanted to kind of cha channel almost the voice of the town. I wanted to channel that place in the voice. Um, and um, so, I, so I think, knowing that that was where I wanted to kind of locate the the energy of the story and how do I create that. Um, so again, you know, opening with this moment of gossip that's set in the central location that you revisit throughout the book um, and introducing these characters that are kind of piping in, um, that to me felt like it channeled kind of the small mindedness of the place and the claustrophobia of the place mm -hmm. and the judgment that uh, the judgmental sort of attitude that pervades this town. I wanted that to come out in the voice as you hear these, these people speculating about um, the skin color of this child. And did, did, you, did, you, was, did you get to that in, in um, magazine writing, uh, in journalism, they, 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 you hear the lead, my father's a journalist and he yeah. talks about the lead, the lead, and he can't go anywhere until he's got his lead. Yeah. Um, did, did this lead come to you or did this fully like pretty fast or did you have to um, just keep going back to the drawing board until you got it and then it could take you the rest of the way? Like, yeah, I mean, I think- the voice? Yeah, I mean, I think this, in the case of this book, it sort of did come to me um, because I don't remember any version of the book that began differently than this. You know, I knew that this is what I wanted to open with and I knew some of the, some of the phrasing I knew that I wanted to have of, of telling the story of the twins and what happened to them and their lives splitting evenly. And I knew all of those things, but I do think, you know, I had, um, a brief journalism career in the high school newspaper. Um, and I do think that that did shape how I begin, how I think about beginning a novel, because that is all of the, you know, when you're writing a news article, it's like you begin with, you know, the inverted pyramid they talk about where you have to begin with providing as much information as you can. And then you, you know, it kind of trickles down because you're thinking if someone just grabs this and they look at it, what are they gonna take from, you know? And I think, Obviously the way that we read fiction is different than reading a news article, but I think that same idea of 
I want to grab somebody who's in a bookstore and flipping through the book and I want them to read the first paragraph and be like, okay, well, I have to wait and see what is going to happen after that. Like, that's the person that I want to grab. Right. Um, so for me, that is, I, and, and I think it's also, you know, it's different for everybody. I don't mean to sound prescriptive. There's some books and some writers that like to begin slowly and kind of ease you in. But, you know, one of my favorite novel openings is Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison. It's just like, we're going to have a guy jump off a building and that's how we're going to open. Um, and that's to me is the type of novel opening that I really love. I'm going to have something big happen and I'm going to provide as much information as I can. That's fabulous. Thank you. Um, I think it would be a great time to read your second passage. Okay. Um, so this one maybe needs a little bit of context. Uh, so this is, so here, um, so we begin with Desiree arriving and here we pick up, we get a little bit of what she had been up to before returning home where she was living in Washington, DC. Um, and here we'll learn a little bit about why she ended up there um, and what she was doing in DC. In DC, Desiree Vignes had learned to read fingerprints. She had never even known that this was something you could learn until the spring of 1956, when walking down Canal Street, she spotted a flyer tacked outside a bakery window announcing that the federal government was hiring. She'd paused in the doorway, staring at the poster. Stella had been gone six months then, time falling in a slow, steady drip. She would forget sometimes, as strange as it sounded, she would hear a funny joke on the streetcar or pass a friend they once knew, and she would turn to tell Stella, hey, did you, before remembering that she was gone, that she had left Desiree for the first time ever alone. And yet, even after six months, Desiree still held out hope. Stella would call. She would send a letter. But each evening, she groped inside the empty mailbox and waited beside a phone that refused to ring. Stella had gone on to craft a new life without her in it, and Desiree was miserable living in the city where Stella abandoned her. So she'd written down the number for the yellow flyer pressed against the bakery window, and she went to the recruitment office as soon as she got off work. The recruiter, skeptical that she'd find anyone of good character in that whole city, was surprised by the neat young woman sitting in front of her. She glanced at her application, stumbling where the girl had marked color. Then she tapped her pen on the box labeled hometown. Mallard, she said, I'd never heard of that place. It's just a little town, Desiree said, north of here. Mr. Hoover likes small towns. The best folks come from small towns, he always says. Well, Desiree said, Mallard is a small town as it gets. In DC, she tried to bury her grief. She rented a room from the other colored woman in the fingerprinting department, Roberta Thomas. More a basement than a room actually dark and windowless, but clean, and most importantly, affordable. It ain't much, Roberta told her on her first day of work, but if you really need a place. She'd offered tentatively, as if she were hoping Desiree might turn her down. She was exhausted, three children and all, and honestly, Desiree just seemed like another to take care of. But she pitied the girl, barely 18, alone in a new city. So the basement it was, a single bed, a dresser, the radiator rattling her to sleep each night. Desiree told herself that she was starting over, but she thought of Stella even more now, wondering what she would make of this city. She'd left New Orleans to escape the memory of her, but she still couldn't fall asleep without rolling over to fill for Stella in bed beside her. At the bureau, Desiree learned arches and loops and whirls, a radial loop flowing toward the thumb versus an ulnar loop flowing toward the pinky, a central pocket loop whirl from a double loop whirl, a young finger from an old one whose ridges were worn down with age. She could identify one person out of a million by studying a ridge, its width, shape, pores, contour, breaks, and creases. On her desk each morning, fingerprints lifted from stolen cars and bullet casings, broken windows and door handles and knives. She processed the fingerprints of anti-war protesters and identified the remains of dead soldiers arriving home wedged on dry ice. She was studying fingerprints lifted from a stolen gun the first time Sam Winston walked past. He wore a lavender tie with a matching silk handkerchief and she was shocked by the brightness of the tie and the boldness of the jet black brother who'd found the nerve to wear it. Later, when she saw him eating with the other attorneys, 
She turned to Roberta and said, I didn't know there were colored prosecutors. Roberta snorted. Of course there is, she said. This ain't that down poke town you come from. Roberta had never heard of Mallard. Nobody outside of St. Landry Parish had. And when Desiree told Sam, he struggled to even imagine it. You're jiving, he said. A whole town of folks as light as you. He'd invited her to lunch one, ap one afternoon, leaning over her cubicle after he'd stopped by to ask about a set of fingerprints. Later, he told her that he hadn't been so desperate about those prints at all. He just wanted to find a reason to introduce himself. Now they were sitting in the National Arboretum watching ducks glide over the pond. Lighter even, she said, thinking about Mrs. Fondo, who'd always boasted that her children were the color of clabber. Sam laughed. Well, you gotta bring me down there sometime, he said. I gotta see this light-skinned city for myself. But he was only flirting. He was born in Ohio and had never ventured south of Virginia. His mother had wanted to send him to Morehouse, but no, he was a Buckeye back before all the dormitories desegregated. He'd sat in classrooms where white professors refused to answer his questions. He'd scraped piss yellow snow off his windshield each winter, dated light girls who would not hold his hand in public. Northern racism he knew, that Southern kind you could keep. As far as he was concerned, his folks had escaped the South for a reason, and who was he to question their judgment? Those rednecks probably wouldn't even let him come home, he always joked. He might go down to visit and wind up chopping cotton. You wouldn't like Mallard, she told him. Why not? Because they funny down there, color struck. That's why I left. Not exactly, although she wanted him to believe that she was nothing like the place she'd come from. She wanted him to believe anything beside the truth, that she was only young and bored and she dragged her sister to a city where she'd lost herself. He was quiet a minute considering this. Then he tilted the bag of breadcrumbs toward her. He'd been ripping up the crust of his sandwich so she could feed the ducks, the type of subtle gallantry she would learn to love about him. She smiled, dipping her hand inside. He would never again offer to visit home with her. She would never ask him to. She told him in the beginning that she hated Mallard. I don't believe you, he said. They were lying in his bed, listening to the rain. What's there to believe? I told you how I feel. Negroes always love our hometowns, he said, even though we're always from the worst places. Only white folks got the freedom to hate home. He was raised in the projects of Cleveland and he loved that city with the fierceness of someone who hadn't been given much to love. She'd only been given a town she'd always wanted to escape and a mother who'd made it clear that she was not welcome back. She hadn't told Sam about Stella yet, it seemed like another thing about Mallard that he wouldn't understand. But as rain splattered against the metal fire escape, she turned toward him and said that she had a twin sister who decided to become someone else. She'll get tired of all that play acting, he said. Bet she comes running back, feeling foolish. You're way too sweet for anyone to stay away. He kissed her forehead and she held him tighter, his heart thumping against her ear. This was back in the beginning, before his hands curled into fists, before he called her uppity yellow bitch or crazy as your sister or off thinking you white, back when she found herself starting to trust him. I think I'll stop yeah. there. Thank you. You know, um, there are a few things I wanna talk about in this passage, but the time, come, you, you've, you, you've gone, you, you, time is so fluid in your novel and it, it's, it's you, you, you move through it so effortlessly, which is, you know, a, a hard thing for students to, to also um, grasp and understand. Um, can, can you speak to, to time and how, how you um, achieve that in terms of craft? Well, thank you. It, I'm glad that it felt effortless to read because it wasn't effortless. Yeah, that's um, that the, was, that's the, that, was yeah. the, right? that was the biggest, I think that was one of the, if not the biggest challenge of this book was trying to figure out the timeline um, because uh, it does do, I don't know, I think I've sort of recently um, or increasingly just uh, kind of disavowed the concept of linear time when I'm writing. <laughs> so um, so I think this book is, is an example of that. I think one of the ways that I was thinking about it in this section and what I found hope, what I find helpful when I'm writing and I want to move through time in a fluid way um, is sometimes thinking about an object. Um, so in this case, the object is, we'll say the fingerprints, right? So I have this person who's working this job 
And fingerprinting allows me to move through time because I can tell you, you know, this is when she started at the job. Um, this is how she met this guy, Sam. Um, there's a section, the section after where I stopped goes kind of in the future a little bit. And it talks about uh, the sort of future of fingerprinting technology. So having that type of, I mean, it's, it's, in this case, it's not really like a tangible thing, but having something like that, I find can be really useful if it's like, you know, here's a car or, you know, it can be anything, a dog, whatever, anything that uh, is something in this character's life. And you can sort of use that as like a totem that will like bring them to different points of their life and, and ways in which it pops up. So that was one thing that I think I was thinking of in this section was that using the fingerprinting and her journey through this work, um, which also, you know, obviously speaks to the, some of the thematics of the book is that she's looking at fingerprints and fingerprints and identity, all those things. Um, but using that concept or that sort of, or an object or, um, something that feels tangible is in, in allowing that to use you then to leap, kind of leap throughout time. So that's one thing I think I was thinking about in that book. And also I think in general relationships, because you also see the progression of this relationship, um, which allows you to kind of move through time. Oh, we see them, her first time she sees them, they meet, they're, you know, in bed together, like it allows you, and then it kind of flashes forward to when it is going to become abusive. So yeah. I think that relationships and the, the kind of natural progression of them can be a way to to move through time, but also having something that feels a little bit more tangible and using that to return to, I think, can be a way to kind of tether yourself even as you are unmoored from the linear time. Mm. You know, also just the way you begin the novel by, uh, you know, uh, telling us everything that's going to happen. I, 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 I would seem to allow for flexibility with time too. You're coming in sort of at the middle in your opening with the return, um, then you're going back in time, but we already know about the, in the future, we're gonna find out what's happened to the sister, to Stella. So you mm -hmm. have, it's like you've established the um, ability to have all that flexibility which I think, um, so. yeah. yeah, I think so. I think that's also what it affords you because you're not, again, you're not, and that's sometimes like where I'll decide when to jump in because I want to give myself that flexibility to move forward or move backward, which is different than if you, and again, back to what we were saying about why you don't withhold things, because sometimes if you're withholding things, then you're thinking, oh, well, I can't tell the reader X because I haven't yet told them Y. You know, but I'm like, no, I've already told you why. So now I can go back and, and touch on all of these other things that I that are, to me are more interesting than just the logistics. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I think that that also affords you that flexibility to kind of move around. It, it, it seems like the key word here is flexibility. How can you achieve the maximum amount of flexibility so that your storytelling can go in, in different directions and have a lot of texture and Yes. Um, you know, possibility and not get locked in. Yes. Um, this, okay, so this, this section also clearly sets in motion the theme of colorism in the novel. And um, I wonder, uh, you know, how, um, if you would speak to colorism and how it fits into anti-Black racism um, and what made you decide to set your book in this community? Yeah, I mean, I think that color and colorism was sort of my entryway to the world of the book. Uh, I really began kind of with the idea of this town more than before I ever got to the twins. Um, so to me, that was kind of the, my sort of entryway into the world of the book. And I was, you know, in the case of this marriage that you see unfolding, um, you know, I was interested in how these dynamics of color and power are playing out within this intimate relationship, uh, because to me, that's one of the um, one of the most sort of complex and difficult things of writing about color is that it, it does speak to these intimate relationships, whether it's, um, you know, who you're dating or who you're marrying or how you feel about your own body. It is a really intimate um, experience. So I wanted to see this. Um, I wanted the reader to see this playing out within this marriage um, and to also, you know, see what Desiree's husband, Sam, has experienced in his life due to his color 
um, and not to, to um, justify the way that he treats her, but to provide that context of the way his experience through color has been so completely different than hers. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that this um, section sets that up and sets up also, I think kind of, again, folding in the mystery of Stella, uh, where, you know, I wanted to constantly think about, you know, even though you don't physically see or physically meet Stella on the page until about halfway through the book, I wanted her to feel present so that even when Desiree is in bed with Sam, she's still thinking about Stella in some way. So I wanted her sort of kind of ghostliness to kind of hover throughout the story in, in all of its different locations and, and situations. So you began with with, the, with with questions of colorism and the, and and mar within a marriage, and then that led you to the twins. When when did this when did the twins in in your conceiving of the book when did they come to you? Yeah, I think it really, I began with sort of the idea of a town um, that was obsessed with color and then the twins from there of these twins who decide to live their life um, on opposite sides of that color line and, and what would come of them. I didn't know what was going to come of them. I didn't know what would happen to Stella or anything. I, I just knew that, you know, that to me was, was always um, just interesting to imagine these twins coming from the same place, but deciding to go in very different directions. Um, so when you started, you didn't think, well, I'm, I'm gonna write about Stella um, live, passing, living a life. Yeah, I knew, yeah, I knew one would pass and one would choose not to. That was, that was the most that I knew. I didn't know where Stella would end up. I didn't know, um, I didn't expect to follow their daughters into the next generation. I really thought it was just going to be about those twin sisters. Um, but then the book kind of continued to expand and expand as I, as I was writing it. Somebody, I forget who is somebody famous, a man said, um, writer said that driving, that writing a novel is like driving in a thick fog at night with your high beams on. You're sort of feeling your way forward. Yes. Um, so uh, the another question that comes that I want to ask about is that we talk a lot about. In fact, I've even taught a class in it. Is is the research that you've done, the fingerprints, the the town, the cities, the um, the whole scope of what what do you do to, for research with your books? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends. I think there are always the things that are the most obvious, you know, so I knew I wanted to read about the history of passing. Um, I wanted to read about the history of race in Louisiana. Um, I wanted to, you know, some of the fingerprint stuff, my, my mom actually worked as a fingerprint examiner. So some of that was just taken from her. Um, but, um, but there were these things that I knew that I needed to know something about. Um, and then I think there are always the things that kind of creep up on you or the things that you kind of enter, um, you sort of enter at them sort of the sort of slanted direction. Um, and I think that to me is the most exciting part about researching when you kind of stumble upon something that ends up being really fascinating to you. You know, um, I think in the case of this book, I, I read a book about death faking um, that I just read because it sounded really fun and it, and it was fun. Um, but it ended up kind of informing how I thought about the psychology of someone who's passing. I began to think about it as a type of death faking. And once I kind of divorced it from the context of race even, and just thought about it as this sort of psychological experience, I saw it in a new way. And that was something that I just stumbled upon this book that I saw people t uh, tweeting about. So I think that um, for me, it's, yeah, I think it's always, I think for me, always wanting to be open-minded and to follow whatever wormhole I go down and trust that it's going to inform the work in some way. How do you know um, when to get out of the wormhole though? <laughs> you just keep going. Yeah, I can. I mean, I think that's, I mean, I, yeah, the new thing I'm working on, I somehow started um, reading about uh, boxing and I just ended up on, in a boxing wormhole um, and it has nothing to do with boxing. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I think for me, it's about kind of balancing it. So I don't want to, I try to research as I'm writing or try to kind of do those things concurrently um, so that I'm not, you know, just only reading all of these things and not actually moving forward in the book. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, I think you never know what's going to inspire you or what's going to inform how you think about something. 
And you might end up, you know, reading a random biography um, of, you know, Muhammad Ali, and maybe that influences you in a different way. Um, but I, I think for me, whenever I have that kind of interest in, oh, this is intriguing in some way, I try to honor it and trust my instincts. And, but at the same time, understand that I want to move forward and not just uh, and not completely, yeah, end up, you know, like when you're on the Wikipedia just yeah. forever <laughs> or the YouTube, whatever. Um, so I try not to, I try to keep moving forward at the same time, but also honor my curiosity because I think you never know what's going to influence you and what could inspire you in the book. Yeah, excellent. I think Stephen King in his book on writing says, you, you just have to know enough to make it look like you know what you're talking about, which yes. is, can put a cap on some of those rabbit hole excursions exactly um would you read your next passage and sure. and um everybody for, first of all i also want to say the book is for sale in the there's a link in the chat and you can start putting your questions there because i want plenty of i i could keep asking questions and <laughs> you know, for the next year so um i want you guys to have a chance too um she's going to read two more passages and so if you have them there and if um, I'll keep my eye on them while you're reading. Yes, okay. So this is uh, a little bit ahead of the book and you learn about the twins, uh, what happened to the twins father who you've been told is dead but you don't exactly know the context of it. So uh, that's this part here. The Vinya's twins left without saying goodbye. So like any sudden disappearance, their departure became loaded with meaning. Before they surfaced in New Orleans, before they were just bored girls hunting fun, it only made sense to lose them in such a tragic way. The twins had always seemed both blessed and cursed. They'd inherited from their mother the legacy of an entire town and from their father, a lineage hollowed by loss. Four Vignes boys, all dead by 30. The eldest collapsed in a chain gang from heat stroke, the second gassed in a Belgian trench, the third stabbed in a bar fight, and the youngest, Leon Vignes, lynched twice, the first time at home while his twin girls watched through a crack in the closet door, hands clamped over each other's mouths until their palms misted with spit. That night, he was whittling a table leg with five white, when five white men kicked in the front door and hauled him outside. He landed hard on his face, his mouth filling with dirt and blood. The mob leader, a tall white man with red gold hair like a fall apple, waved a crumpled note in which he claimed Leon had written nasty things to a white woman. Leon couldn't read or white, write. His customers knew that he made all of his marks with an X, but the white men stomped on his hands, broke every finger and joint, then shot him four times. He survived, and three days later, the white men burst into the hospital and stormed every room in the colored ward until they found him. This time they shot him twice in the head, his cotton pillowcase blooming red. Desiree witnessed the first lynching, but would forever imagine the second, how her father must have been sleeping, his head slumped, the way he nodded off in his chair after supper, how the thundering boots woke him, he screamed or maybe had no time to, his swollen hands bandaged and useless at his sides. From the closet, she'd watched the white men drag her father out of the house, his long legs drumming against the floor. She suddenly felt that her sister would scream, so she squeezed her hand over Stella's mouth and seconds later felt Stella's hand on her own. Something shifted between them in that moment. Before, Stella seemed as predictable as a reflection. But in the closet, for the first time ever, Desiree hadn't known what her sister might do. At the wake, the twins wore blatching, might, matching black dresses with full slips that itched their legs. Days earlier, Bernice Lagrosse, the seamstress had come by to pay her respects and found Adele Vignes trying to darn a pair of Leon's church pants for his burial. Her hands were shaking, so Bernice took the needle and patched up the pants herself. She didn't know how Adele would handle this on her own. The sores were used to soft things, to long, easy lives. The twins didn't even have funeral dresses. The next morning, Bernice carried over a bolt of black fabric and knelt in the living room with her tape measure. She still couldn't tell the twins apart and felt too embarrassed to ask. So she gave simple commands like, you, hand me them scissors or stand up straight, honey. She told the fidgety twin, stop wiggling girl, or you're gonna get sticked. And the other twin grabbed her hand until she stilled. Unnerving, Bernice thought, glancing between the girls, like sewing a dress for one person split into two bodies. 
After the burial, Bernice gathered in Adele's crowded living room, admiring her handiwork as the twins scampered past. The fidgety twin, who she would later learn was Desiree, pulled her sister's hand as they wove past the grown folks who huddled and whispered. Leon couldn't have written that note. The white men must have been angered over something else and who could understand their rages. Willie Lee heard that the white men were angry that Leon stole their business by underbidding them. But how could you shoot a man for accepting less than what you asked for? White folks kill you if you want too much, kill you if you want too little. Willie Lee shook his head, packing tobacco into his pipe. You gotta follow their rules, but they change them when they feel. Devilish, you ask me. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, it's so painful. Um, a, a student of mine asks a question um, that I wanted to get at too, so I'll ask his. He says, your novel, The Vanishing Half, is written in conversation with well-established fiction tropes. Uh, how do you approach a project with an awareness of the literature which has come before? And we speak about this in class as well, of course, is that we have everything that's come before behind us um, as writers, um, no matter you know from what point in time we're writing, um, whether we're a student or you know somebody who's out there publishing. Uh, I heard you speak last night at, at, tea, at the Tea um, Book Club about Nella Larson, who you know so deeply, intimately. It was, oh, it was a, a, a Google it or find it on YouTube because it was wonderful. But I do, um, I would love to, to hear you speak about your influences in particular, you know, Nella Larson on this, on, this, um, on this book or just generally. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the books that I love in the, you know, anything, TV, movies, music, whatever, I love things that are aware of their influences and embrace them because I think sometimes there can be this feeling of, being afraid that you're going to seem derivative or being afraid that you're going to seem unoriginal and sort of hiding from them or running from them. <laughs> and I love things that embrace what came before them and are in aware of being in conversation. Like I think that's actually far more interesting than trying to pretend as if you are sort of, you know, inventing the wheel. Um, so I think that that was one thing that I knew. I knew that I was writing into a literary tradition of passing literature. Um, I think that if then once you're doing that, you want to be aware of what the conventions of the genre are, because there are ways in which you might want to, you know, uh, you know, do something different than those conventions. There are ways in which you might want to, you know, sort of uh, subvert the expectation of them. So, you know, there were a lot of a lot of those moments. I think in the book. I mean, I think one the sort of general history of of passing literature and the, you know, sort of figure of the tragic mulatto and all of those things that I knew were kind of bearing on the book. But then there were all other things like, you know, the melodrama as a form, which I felt found really fun to play with because there is a very melodramatic setup to this novel of, you know, twins that are separated and long lost, you know, and, and their hidden identities and all of these sort of conventions of melodrama. And then I, to go a step farther so I was like okay I'm gonna invent a soap opera that's in this book and you're gonna watch this person be in this fake soap opera uh, but that was something that I had fun doing because oh, I was aware right. that that was the convention and that was the sort of genre I was in you know yeah. so it, it, it allowed me to then kind of go a step farther and be aware of it and I knew that the reader would be aware of it too and you know soap operas love, you know, uh, evil twins and all of those <laughs> types of things. So I wanted to play into it. So I think being aware of what came before your work is really important. Finding if there are aspects of that that you want to embrace or if there are aspects of it that you want to subvert. I think that all of that, either of those, either of those things can be really fruitful and generative creatively. Um, and as for the inspiration, yeah, yeah I love, um, I talked about Nell Larson's passing and what I love that that book does um, as, a, as a work of, um, of literature and a book that is interested in deeply sort of psychologically plumbing the characters um, and a, in a book that's also not judgmental about passing. It doesn't condemn the characters. Um, and that was something that I knew I wanted to bring into the world of this book too. So that was a book that was definitely um, influential as us working on this one. Fabulous. Another student of mine um, asks Phoebe Elgin, Elgin Jones, 
Um, uh, how have your personal experiences with colorism or racism informed your writing? Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to say because those experiences are fundamental to who you are in some way. So, you I, you know, I know that a lot of them have trickled in in ways that I am not even necessarily aware of. Um, I think the biggest thing for me was wanting to write about both of those topics in a way that felt embodied because I think that sometimes we can't, even in, you know, the sort of capital D discourse, um, we can talk uh, about issues like colorism or racism in ways that feel more abstract. Um, and for me, I always wanted to locate them and in, in what characters are experiencing in their lives, how characters are feeling in their bodies, how they're moving through the world in their bodies. Those were always things that I wanted to come back to because to me, there always is an embodied component. Um, even when you're talking about something that is structural and institutional, there is an embodied component to it. And to me, that is where I wanted the fiction to always return. So that you understand how Jude feels when she is you know, in her bathing suit and these kids are laughing at her skin color. Like I wanted you to understand that and not just the idea of this as a ideology, um, although it's obviously both. So I wanted to bring that into it um, and, and always focus on the characters. I think, you know, when you're, you know, I sometimes get asked about writing about issues, um, quote unquote. And I, I don't know that I even think that I write about issues. I think that I'm writing about characters that are having experiences. And I always want to return to that more than anything of who these characters are and how things like race or colorism are affecting them in their lives. Um, well, I, I, I wonder, you know, um... I think of Flaubert saying, um, Madame Bovary, c'est moi. Um, I, I am Madame Bovary. And how do you have a lot of characters here, and they're so fully realized. I, I feel the, the pain in all of them, or the whatever emotion they're feeling. Um, how, do you, how do you do that? How do you <laughs> get, get in there and become them? or? how do you take out of you and put into them some aspect? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a big question. <laughs> um, I don't know if I have an answer for it. Um, I think, you know, I think I heard, um, I did a, a Zoom thing with Jackie Woodson uh, recently and she said something that I will steal, which was, you know, she said that her work is not literally autobiographical, but it's emotionally autobiographical. And that's how I feel about my work in general and particularly this book. You know, I obviously was not alive at the point in which this book opens. I have not been uh, a person who shares the identity with, you know, many of these different characters and, and their different sort of uh, races and genders and all of these things. That's not me, um, but wanting to sort of plumb the emotions that, uh, that I felt or wanting to uh, you know, speak to these questions that I have had about just being alive. I think that to me is always what I come back to in, in thinking about character. Um, so I try not to put pressure on myself to find a way to mine my life for, to, to write a character. I think for me, I'm always just wanting to get deeper and get deeper and get closer to the character and ask myself, you know, what does this person want? What are they what secrets are they keeping from people that are close to them? What secrets are they keeping from themselves? Those are, to me, are the really juicy questions that allow you to get to who a person is. Um, well, there's so many questions here that I'm just, um, uh, this Jackie Robinson says, only white folks have the freedom to hate home. Please elaborate. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it, it says, I think it probably says it all um, from what Sam is saying, you know, he thinks that um, he thinks that it's a privilege to be able to hate your home. Uh, and that's why he he embraces this place that has hurt him. And he's kind of throwing it back in Desiree's face to be like, you know, you're also privileged to say that you hate your home. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think that's, that's what Sam means in that context. Uh, would you like to read your final passage for us? I can, but if, if we have a lot of questions that you would rather get to, I can do that too. Um, okay. Well, um, let's, let's do that. I'll just go through them. Athleen has sent them to me. And so I'll okay, just, great. some of them are, are 
we've already gotten to. So this that's okay. where I get. Um, in your writing process for this particular book, what was the first thing that started you off? Did you have an idea? I, you've sort of gotten into that, but anything to add? Did she begin there and add it after she set up the story? Um, yeah, no, yeah, no, I don't know that I have too much to add to that, but I, yeah, I began with the town, I think first it, and that's not normally how I write, but I did begin with setting here uh, for the first time. Huh. Uh, when using dialogue, how do you incorporate it to make it the most effective for your piece? Yeah, I think dialogue is a big, oh, it's a big thing. I could talk about this for a long time, but um, I will try not to. <laughs> um, but I think for me, what I like to think about with dialogue is I want dialogue to do a few things. I want it to um, establish character. I want it, like what, what you say tells me a lot about who you are. It tells me where you're from, how you speak, uh, how old you are maybe, if English is your first language. Um, it will tell me a lot of things about you. So I wanted to establish character in that way. Um, I want it to move the plot ahead if it can, um, and or I want it to speak to a conflict. Um, and I think that's what I feel most frustrated in, in reading dialogue is when it doesn't do those things. And again, these are just my personal preferences. These are not rules, um, but when I think about that, I want, uh, you know, because there's a lot of ways you can convey information in a book that you don't have to have somebody say it. Um, and I remember having also a professor when I was in grad school who said her, her tip for writing dialogue was, okay, imagine that these are actors that you are paying to speak. Yeah. Would you pay them to say that line? Like, would you pay someone to say, yeah, or would you pay someone to say, you know, whatever sort of expository thing that the characters are saying? Um, I think that's the dialogue that I think to, to me when I'm going through, I have to get rid of first because you, that's what the narrator is for. Like the narrator can provide exposition or can provide background information. You don't have to have somebody say, um, you know, well, since I saw you two weeks ago, you know, you don't have to do that. Um, and that's one of the things that I love about fiction is that, you know, there's a reason why movies and TV sometimes have to resort to that because they can't, there is not the narrator that can give you all the background information, but that's the tool that we have available to us as fiction writers. So I want to think about all of those things, but I think for me, the big thing is thinking about what the tension is because, and it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be people fighting or screaming at each other, but you want there to be tension within the dialogue if you're pausing to hear people talk, I think. Um, so I, I want to think about what the tension is, what these people want from each other. Um, you know, I want to think about all of those things, I think, when I'm writing dialogue. Um, fabulous. Uh, for, um, this is Mashani. For you, where does your um, inspiration come from? Is it a single thing or an amalgamation of several things? Did you know ahead what you wanted to be? And what was your navigation like through each setting? I guess, did you always know you wanted to be a writer? Um, I did. I always did want to be a writer since I was um, a kid. Um, and I don't know about where my inspiration comes from. I think I just always loved reading. Um, I think that was, uh, you know, I think true of probably most of us as writers. Um, I always loved reading. And I think as I, you know, I think what I was saying earlier is I always want to be open to all of the different things that may inspire me that are different than what I imagine. Um, so, you know, for this book, like I said, there were these random kind of wormholes that I fell down. Um, there were conversations with my mother, there were books I read, uh, movies, you know, listening to music, all of those things fed into the work um, in really fruitful and interesting ways. Um, so I think for me, you know, I'm always just wanting to tell a story that's interesting and that's compelling and wanting to tell it in the best way that I can tell it um, and trying to keep my eyes open and my heart open for all of the different places that could feed into that work. Mm. Uh, when you're starting out on a new project, what comes to you first? Is it the character or plot or images you start creating a story from? That's from Gabrielle Pascal. Yeah, I think it really depends. Um, you know, I think, uh, I'm trying to remember from my first book, I don't remember what arrived to me first. It was probably the situation. I think it was just, you know, this teenage girl who gets pregnant by her pastor's son and decides to terminate the pregnancy. That was, I think the first thing that I kind of had from there. 
Um, but that book took, you know, seven or eight years. So it took a lot of developments and it changed a lot very dramatically. Um, and The Vanishing Habits, it started with setting. Um, the new thing I'm working on, maybe, I don't know, maybe the situation or the relationship is kind of what is my entry point. So I think it all does really depend. Um, but I think for me, I'm always interested in relationships. I think that the, the, that's kind of my, the engine that is driving me forward with the mothers. It was these two best friends. Vanishing Habits is these twin sisters. Next book is their kind of begin as friends and as enemies. Um, so uh, different, um, different types of relationships I've been interested in, but I think that to me is always what's at the center when I start writing. I always want to think about what is everything bringing me back to as I'm writing. And with The Vanishing Half, I was like, okay, everything needs to point in some way back to the twins. Even if you're not with the twins, maybe you're with Jude or you're with Reese or you're with these other characters everything that's happening needs to point back to them in some way, because that was the center of the book. Uh, Vicki Sue says, when writing different asks, when writing different characters, how do you go about ensuring that they all have their own voices and not blend together? A lot of times when writing characters, they end up with the same speaking style as the writer. How would you uh, go about avoiding that? I think one thing that's just logistically helpful is reading it out loud and you will hear if it all sounds the same. Um, so that's one thing I do once I've written it. Um, the other thing, um, again, on the sort of dialogue conversation, the other thing that I find sometimes helpful, some I've done this exercise before and some people hate it. So take it with a grain of salt, but sometimes just writing the dialogue with nothing in between, like no interiority, no description, no narration, just lines of dialogue and again when you do that you will see you will hear how people are speaking you will have at least for me when I'm doing it I'll have people speak I'll hear how they speak I'll hear sort of the natural flow of the dialogue of the conversation I'll kind of track where the conversation is going in the moments where it turns one way but it could turn a different way and then I might stop and then write it going in that other direction um, but I think it also allows you to hear the voice of the person speaking and, you know, does this person drop their G's? Does this person say ain't versus is? Does this person, you know, speak in short sentences or are they sarcastic or um, are they really blunt? You know, all of those things I think you can hear once you read out loud and once you pause to sort of focus on it. So that's sometimes something that I will do, particularly in moments where people are having like a heightened conversation like if it's a big argument sometimes I will just write out that argument and feel like okay this is where both of these people are coming from this is you know you know I think arguments and conversations it's like sort of a dance you know you're like watching the different players moving around each other and sometimes just clearing out the room and just focusing on the conversation can be helpful for me in both voice, but also deciding where the conversation goes and where I land and who says what to who and all of those things. So sometimes I can find that helpful. Some people hate it, um, but I, I find it a helpful exercise. Um, it, it, there, this is, a, um, I'm not sure I'm getting it 100%. Very acute writing about trans experience. Has this touched your life personally? How did you capture the journey and write about it happening in a time prior to current acceptance? Yeah, I think that that, um, that that was the, I mean, both of those things were challenging for me in writing about this character, Reese. Um, one, as you said, um, I was writing about a time uh, in which I wasn't alive. Again, I was writing, I was writing about an experience um, of a trans man that I have not experienced as a, as a cisgender woman and also writing about this in a time where I was not even alive. Um, so I knew that both of those things were difficult to, to do. Um, I think a lot of it, again, was uh, reading, um, trying to read first person accounts from transgender men during that time period specifically. Um, so that was one of the things that I tried to do in, in creating um, this character. And then the other thing was being fortunate enough to have um, to have trans friends who could read the book for me. Um, I have a friend named Cass who is a scholar of trans literature and trans history. And both of those things were completely invaluable. Um, he read the draft and gave me great feedback and helped me brainstorm certain, um, you know, how this character would go about trying to access the healthcare that he needs at this specific time period, 
Um, so he, his feedback was so helpful for me and crucial and, and trying to figure out just like plot things. Um, so I think a lot of, it was a mixture of all of those things. Um, you know, I wanted to create this character in a way that, uh, that, um, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't even know. I just, I just wanted uh, to create this, this love story for Jude really. Um, and to create this love story between Jude and Reese, who are these two characters that have both um, experienced a lot of, of pain and, and shame surrounding their bodies and, and uh, come together and have to learn how to trust each other and allow themselves to be loved by somebody else. That to me was always at the heart of, of that character and that relationship in particular. Um, so I wanted to write it with um, as much, um, you know, awareness that I could of the fact that this was not my experience. And I didn't want to horribly misrepresent um, the experience of this, you know, young trans guy in the, ninth, the late 1970s. Um, so I was aware of, I think, the the challenges of of writing the storyline. But I was really lucky to have uh, resources and friends who were able to help me. That's great. And this question is about um, what is your process about process? Do you do a lot of drafts? Are you um, uh, you know, does it take you a long time to do a draft and then your editing process? Um, yeah, I do a lot of drafts. Um, I, uh, this book, I don't even know how many drafts it took me. It felt like I was constantly rewriting it. Um, I, I, um, I don't outline. I really do just kind of uh, riff what I'm drafting. Um, and just follow whatever is interesting and whatever's fun. I think the for I love drafting. Um, I think that the first draft, you know, I, all it has to do is exist. That's it. So um, I try to just riff. I try to have a sense of playfulness and follow what brings me joy and what is exciting to me and what's most challenging to me. I try to think about that when I'm drafting. When the revision comes around, that's when it gets a bit more, uh, I think, challenging for me, <laughs> um, because then you have to start making decisions. Um, and as soon as you make one decision, that leads to these other cascading consequences. Um, so, so from there, I, I do different things. I, sometimes I will outline after I've written a draft, because outlining before writing it makes me feel like I'm giving myself homework. But outlining after I've written it, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna take a step back and look at what I have and look at the order that things are happening and what are the story beats and what point of view am I in? Sometimes that kind of peeling back and looking at it can be helpful of doing a sort of reverse, I guess, outline. Um, I've increasingly become aware that I'm kind of a visual person. So I will use flashcards now. I have a whiteboard where I will kind of map out or draw out the shape of the story the shape of the chapter or wherever I am, um, I'll do that. I finally, after three books, have started using a timeline. Um, I don't know who needs to hear this, but make a timeline for your book so that you're not sitting there thinking, how old was this person in whatever year? Um, I've never done it. I always regret it. So I have a timeline that I've updated with events, uh, you know, how old people are when certain things are happening or when, you know, events in time and the order that those events happen. Um, so that just allows me logistically to figure out what the heck is going on. And I'm not sitting there trying to do math while writing, God forbid. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these are just different, different tools that I've tried to bring in and embrace about my process. But I think everyone's process is different. There's some writers I know who make spreadsheets, like they need to, you know, they, uh, they, they find it really helpful to have like an Excel spreadsheet that, you know, maps out the book. Um, you know, there are lots of people that, that, you know, are, and who do, who do, uh, who write books in lots of different ways. But for me, it's kind of a mixture of, it's controlled chaos, I suppose. It's chaos, the first draft. And then after that, I try to have some type of sense of, okay, what's going on here? Um, figuring out, you know, what are the events that are happening in what order? Um, the points of view, all of those things, then it becomes a little bit more nuts and bolts for me. So here are just a couple of statements. The fact that in your novel, like this is Phoebe again, like Larson speak about the fear of children coming out darker skinned and how this week we heard from Megan being faced with <laughs> yeah. the same racism from the royal family. Um, yeah. yeah, somebody says emotionally autobiographical, how interesting. Another, I was reminded of the Delaney sisters first 100 years, although they had different complexions, their lives were greatly influenced by colorism. 
Um, and then and, and Andrea Libresco asks, you mentioned that the mothers changed a lot. Can you share some of the ways it changed and why? And I've just got to say, I love the voice you create in the mothers of the, the, the collective older mothers speaking in you know this um, uh, first person plural. I loved that. Thank you. I mean, well, that's one of the big things that changed as I was working on the book. Um, that came in pretty late, actually, into the process. It was maybe about a year before the book was finished. And um, before it was just sort of in this very third person um, kind of point of view. And I, as I was working on it, I realized that the voice of that third person, it sounded very specific. It, it sounded like very apart from the teenagers that I was writing about. So then I started to, uh, you know, what, what happens if I actually kind of lean into that and, and write from the direct voice of these church mothers and it becomes this sort of Greek chorus. Um, so that was something that came about pretty late into the book. Um, the book took so many different iterations because I was working on it for, you know, seven or eight years. I, I kind of grew up alongside those characters. Um, you know, at first I thought that the book would, would mostly just take place in the summer right after Nadia decides to have this abortion and that would be it. It would be like three months and that's the book. Um, and then later realized, um, I think again, in part, we had a visiting professor who came to Michigan and she was talking about coming of age stories and how sometimes we like to think that coming of age happens in a moment, but it doesn't, it happens over a series of moments. And that's the way we all experience it. Like we understand that in our own lives but when it comes to fiction, it's like, well, the coming of age story is about the summer when X happened. Um, and when she said that, it kind of challenged me to think, oh, okay, well, what happens if I go beyond that summer? What happens when Nadia's in college? What happens after college? Um, and the book just kind of expanded for me. It gave me that flexibility that you were talking about earlier that I really wanted. Um, so it expanded into the timeline. Um, there was also originally a phantom uh, brother, um, Luke had a brother who was in love with Aubrey, so there was kind of instead of there being a love triangle, it was like a love rectangle originally, and then I realized, oh, guess what, there's a reason why love triangles are better, because they're, they're really, you know, there's a lot of pressure on love triangle, because most likely one person is not going to get what they want, like that's what's fun about a love triangle. Um, is that generally speaking, and you know, can, with the in the context of monogamous relationships between two people, there's one person that's going to be left out of that triangle, and that's why it's fun. So I kind of killed off that brother. I sent him to the ether, and that was when the book I think really came alive. I had to, you know, in the I you know I hate the cliche of killing your darlings, but once I got rid of that brother who I'd been fighting for years, I had a feeling that he wasn't working, and I just got grew so attached to him because I'd been writing this person for five years or something at that time. But once I finally banished him from the book, the, that was what I needed was to have that triangle because it brought those three characters in as tightly together as I possibly could get them. And that was what amped up the, the, the conflict and the stakes of the book. So a lot of it, it was a, it was a, it was a long process of writing that book, but it taught me so much, I think, about writing a novel and trusting my instincts, listening to myself when something doesn't feel right. So I don't have to wander into the wilderness for, <laughs> for all that time that it spent me to, to get rid of that brother. Um, and to, yeah, like I said, try everything. I mean, it sounds trite, but I tell my students that of just try it and maybe it doesn't work, but you'll at least know. Um, you know what I it love? Doesn't work. What I love about everything that you're saying here and said earlier about relationships to that you go to the relationships in the in the storytelling is that you're always finding the nerve point um, where the where is the nerve and you're going you're drilling into it and um, finding the story is coming out through there. Yeah, so I, um, I'm, I would there's one more question, but I, I want to ask if you would mind closing by reading that passage and we would just I'll ask this one last question from Ethna Lay and then um if, if because I, I just want everybody to hear it it's it's great and, and then remember everybody at the top of the chat is the link to the bookstore um Ethna asks you make writing sound so easy I wonder about the multiple vanishings that happen the many other halves outside of the twins who cleave together and become whole, the last scene of Jude and Greece, the two halves as whole, in the water comes to mind. 
Did you apply any vanishings after you completed the whole novel, the vanishing town, any particular vanishing relationships, the vanishing memories? Yeah, I mean, I don't mean to make it sound easy. <laughs> I, 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 um, I think that some of those, uh, those kind of themes that you're speaking to, some of them were very intentional. Um, so obviously, you know, what happens with Stella and her family and and all of that, that for sure, uh, Stella being kind of the vanishing sister and the vanishing half of the family, all those things were really intentional. Um, but there were other things that that did just sort of uh, come out organically. So the Adele's vanishing memories that you spoke to, like I don't think that that was something I sat down to to deliberately write. Um, that was uh, something that you know my grandmother had Alzheimer's, so to me that that was some place that I wanted to think about that. Um, and the, the town disappearing, um, I think that that was something I had in mind of this kind of town that doesn't exist on a map eventually being kind of disappearing into the ether. But a lot of these things, some of them were intentional, some of them were not. I think, you know, again, I think a lot of it is about listening to yourself. Um, I don't mean to sound too like woo woo about it, but I think that a lot of the process of writing for me has been learning um, how to how to listen to myself and follow what is interesting to me. And I think also, you know, part of my sort of post MFA life has been about that, because I think there were sometimes ways in which when I was in grad school where I ignored myself, I was listening to the workshop. And I mm. think that the workshop can be really helpful. Um, but eventually, there comes a time where you have to learn how to listen to yourself again. And, and I think you'll find you'll find those moments with the story, it's kind of you're like listening to notes kind of reverberate against each other and you'll hear it, but you have to trust yourself to hear it, I think. Um, so, so yeah, so I will end with this passage. This is from when we finally catch up with Stella um, and we see what she has been up to and what she has been up to is trying to <laughs> prevent her neighborhood from integrating. Um, so this is a little bit glimpse of what Stella's life is like. For what it's worth, Blake Sanders had been surprised as anyone that his wife had spoken up in that meeting. She wasn't one for demonstrating. He'd never seen her riled up enough about any issue to do more than sign a petition. And even then it was usually because she was too polite to shove a clipboard back into some college kid's face like he would have done. Sure, he wanted to keep the planet clean. He thought the war was rotten, but that didn't mean that screaming in the faces of decent hardworking people was the right way to go about any of it. But Stella indulged these idealists, listened to their speeches, signed their petitions, all because she was too sweet to tell them to bug off. Yet here she was now, somehow, as fervent as any of these young protesters, in the middle of the association meeting. He could have laughed, his shy Stella making a scene, although maybe he shouldn't have been surprised. A woman protecting her home came from a place more primal than politics. Besides, in all the time he'd known her, she'd never spoken kindly of a Negro. It embarrassed him a little to tell the truth. He respected the natural order of things, but he didn't have to be cruel about it. As a boy, he'd had a colored nanny named Wilma who was practically family. He still sent her a Christmas card each year, but Stella wouldn't even hire colored help for the house. She claimed Mexicans worked harder. He never understood why she averted her gaze when an old Negro woman shuffled past on the sidewalk while she was always so curt with the elevator operators. She was jumpy around Negroes like a child who'd been bit by a dog. That night, as they slipped out of the clubhouse, he smiled, offering his arm to her cheekily. It was a brisk April night. They passed slowly under the jacaranda trees, beginning to bloom lavender over their heads. I didn't know I'd married such a rabble rouser, he said. He was a banker's son who'd left Boston to attend college. He told her when they first met, although he didn't mention then that the bank at which his father was an executive was Chase National and the college he'd left to attend Yale. She would later realize that these were signs that he truly came from wealth, how rarely he wore expensive clothes, even though he could afford to, how little he talked about his father or his inheritance. He'd studied finance and marketing, and instead of heading to Madison Avenue, he'd followed his fiance back to her hometown of New Orleans. The relationship fizzled, but by then he'd fallen in love with the city. That's how he ended up working in the marketing department in Maison Blanc, and that was why he was hiring her, Stella Vignes, as his new secretary. Even after eight years of marriage, Stella still felt a little squeamish when people asked how they'd met. A boss, his secretary, a tale as old as time. It made you picture a greasy haired potbelly and suspenders chasing a young girl around his desk. 
I wasn't some old lech, Blake had said once, laughing at a dinner party, and it was true. He was 28 thin, hard jawed, with ruffled blonde hair and bluish gray eyes like Paul Newman. And maybe that was what made his attention different. Back then, she'd withered when a white man noticed her. Under Blake's gaze, she blossomed. Did I make a fool out of myself? She asked later. She was sitting in front of the vanity, brushing out her hair. Blake eased behind her, unbuttoning his white shirt. Of course not, he said, but it'll never happen, Stell. I don't know why everyone's getting all worked up. But you saw Percy up there. He looks plumb scared. Blake laughed. I love when you say things like that. Like what? Your country talk. Oh, don't make fun. Not right now. I'm not. I think it's cute. He stooped to kiss her cheek, and in the mirror, she watched his fair head bend over her dark one. Did she look as nervous as she felt? Would anyone be able to tell? A colored family in the neighborhood. Blake was right, it would never happen. The association would put a stop to it. They had lawyers on hand for such a thing, didn't they? What was the purpose of having an association if not to stop undesirables from moving in? If not to ensure the neighborhood exists precisely as the neighbors wished? She tried to steady that flutter in her stomach, but she couldn't. She'd been caught before, only once the second time she'd ever pretended to be white. During her last summer in Mallard, weeks after venturing into the charm shop, She'd gone to the South Louisiana Museum of Art on an ordinary Saturday morning, not Negro Day, and walked right up to the main entrance, not the side door where Negroes lined up in the alley. Nobody stopped her, and again, she'd felt stupid for not trying this sooner. There was nothing to being white except boldness. You could convince anyone you belonged somewhere if you acted like you did. In the museum, she glided slowly through the rooms, studying the fuzzy impressionists, she was listening distractedly as an elderly docent intoned to a circle of listless children when she noticed a, a Negro security guard in the corner of the room staring. Then he'd winked and horrified, she rushed past him, head down, barely breathing until she stepped back into the bright morning. She rode the bus back to Mallard, her face burning. Oops, your, your sound is gone again. I still can't hear you. Hello? Yeah, there, there we go. I'm back, okay. Burning. Was there. Burning was the last word. Okay, I'm so sorry. Of yeah. course, passing wasn't that easy. Of course, that colored guard recognized her. We always know our own, her mother said. And now a colored family moving across the street. Would they see her for what she was, or rather what she wasn't? Blake kissed the back of her neck, slipping his hand inside her robe. Don't worry about it, honey, he said. The association will never allow it. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Uh, this was just so wonderful. Lots of applause. Thank um, you. <laughs> really, thank you for your time. Uh, I want to let everybody know that our next great writer, great um, reading event is on the 7th of April, and it's Major Jackson, the poet. I look forward to seeing all of you there, and I see lots of, uh, lots of Zoom clapping hands here <laughs> for you. Thank you very, very much. Thank Good you. Night. Thanks, everybody. Stay Thank safe. You.